Great to see on the first Sunday in January 2020. You know, they're saying to make sure this year you write out the full date. Don't just write, you know, 1 slash 5 slash 20 because there's fraud that can happen. So uh, make sure you write out the full date. The things that will happen in 2020, no one knows but God. We're looking forward to a great year here at First Baptist Church. Give your Bibles open to Acts chapter 27. Acts 27. We're looking forward to a great year. And we prayed about, I prayed about what theme, or what our theme ought to be this year for our church. We've had themes in the past, please Him. Continue. And this year, I've asked for our theme to be, I believe God. You know, the choice in life to believe God will change every other choice. In 2020, what you choose to believe will influence your entire year. I propose that a choice for all of us must be made to believe God as an individual, as a family, as a church, to believe God. Believe what he says, believe who he is, believe that what he says will happen, what he says he will do, he will do, and how he says things will work, will work. We choose to believe God. This choice to believe God or not to believe God affects everything else in my life. If I believe God, then I will raise my kids accordingly, as the Bible says, in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If I believe God, then I will pattern my finances accordingly. As a steward, I desire to be found faithful, not a hoarder or spendthrift, but always using his resources to further his kingdom. If I believe God, then I will live my life and pattern it after his way. I'll acknowledge him in all my ways, trusting that he will direct my path. If I believe God, then I will work the way he'd have me to work and apply myself so that whatever my hand finds to do, I'll do it with all of my might. And if I believe God, then no matter what circumstances come along my way, I will trust Him. I will be careful or worry about nothing but committing everything to prayer with thanksgiving. I want us to choose this year as a church, as individuals, as families, to believe God. You say, well, Pastor, I've been at this church longer than you've been alive, and that's true for some of you. But I didn't say I want you to choose to come to church. I want you to choose to believe God. Yeah. Say, well, Pastor, I, I've read my Bible through many, many times, and I hope you read your Bible through and read the whole counsel of God. But I didn't ask you. I'm not asking you right now to read your Bible. I'm asking you to choose to believe God. Yeah. Well, but, but Pastor, you understand, I, I put a lot of money in the plate for you. I'm not asking you right now that, to give more money. I'm asking you to choose to believe God. Yeah. A choice that we must make. Often we make this choice and our actions and our mouths speak differently. So yes, I believe God in the moment we walk out of church. We choose to believe our own thinking. We solve problems our own way. Charles Spurgeon, tremendous man of faith and character and a pastor, said this, If our faith be worth anything, it will stand the test. He said that guilt... Not guilt is what we feel, but guilt with gold is afraid of fire, but gold is not. He said that paste gems dread to be touched by real diamonds, but the true jewel fears no test. He went on to say it is a poor faith which can only trust God when friends are true and the body full of health and the business profitable. But that is true faith which holds by the Lord's faithfulness. When friends are gone, when the body is sick, when spirits are depressed and the light of our Father's countenance is hidden, a faith which can say in trouble, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him as a heaven-born faith. If you look in Acts chapter 27 this morning, we have an account of Paul when he was going to Rome. If you would look at the end near in the middle of the chapter in verse number 22, we're going to see where we take our text for this theme this year and then kind of backtrack in this chapter where Paul says, And now I exhort you, verse 22, to be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship. For there stood with me, or by me this night, the angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, verse 25, be of good cheer, for, read those next three words, I believe God. 
that it shall be even as it was told me, howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. Lord, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for the testimony we have here of Paul. Lord, I pray this morning you would help me to articulate and say those things clearly, which would be from your word. Lord, help our minds to be open. May our hearts be touched. Would your spirit work? Lord, would you challenge us, convict us, correct us, and touch us? Lord, help us to choose to believe you, even when everything points to something else. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, leave your Bibles open in Acts chapter 27. We come to Acts chapter 27, and we come to the middle of the chapter at this point, and where Paul stands up in front of the whole boat, 276 passengers on this boat, mid-sized boat by that time frame, and he says a few things to these unbelieving soldiers and sailors. First of all, he says, sirs, be of good cheer. Now understand something, Paul was not talking to fellow believers or other Christians. He was talking to seasoned sailors and hardened soldiers and a bunch of criminals. Who was this guy, this missionary, this evangelist, this preacher? Who is he to say, be of good cheer? Well, that's the preachers always say, isn't it? Be of good cheer. Don't worry about it. Well, easy for you to say, Paul, except Paul's still on the boat. He's not saying be a good cheer from the shore. He didn't send an email or a text message. He's on the boat with everybody else when he makes this proclamation, this challenge. And then he gives a testimony. I'm asking us to take this year those three words, I believe God. I want to look at this morning the background of this particular passage of this phrase. Throughout the Bible, we can find many people, but I love where Paul is at when he makes this claim this stand and this testimony. He was probably around 50 to 55 years old at this time. Scholars debate, but they're within about two years of each other. So if you want to say he's 48 or 57, I won't fight you. He's not, by Bible standards, a young man, though he's maybe a little grayer in the head. He's gone now on three different missionary journeys. He is not a novice to traveling by boat or handling problems. He's been shipwrecked before. He's been beaten already. He's had the crowds come after him, all in the sake and in the name of preaching the gospel. He's planted multiple churches at this point. He's obviously grown up at the feet of Gamal in in, uh, the teaching of the Hebrew culture, religion. And he has obviously been converted on the road to Damascus. Where is he going? Verse 1 tells us he's going to Rome. You may remember that a few chapters previously he was standing before Festus and he uh, declared that he wanted to stand before Caesar to be heard. He was getting nowhere with with Agrippa and Festus. He was getting nowhere uh, with his current case, the trial. And so he said, "I, I choose as a Roman citizen to stand before Caesar. And so these men said, fine then, Caesar, you've claimed, then Caesar, you will go. You've appealed unto Caesar, so now you must go. And that takes us to chapter 27, verse number 1, if you look there. And when it was determined that we should sail into Italy, they delivered Paul and certain other prisoners. These other prisoners were also going to Rome. These other prisoners had probably not appealed to Caesar. This appeal to Caesar was a very rare appeal Most likely, the historians and scholars tell us that these prisoners were going because they were of the most debauched criminals. They were going to stand before an animal or some type of judgment in that sense. That's why they're going to Rome to do this, not just a local government. They were not your run-of-the-mill criminals. They most likely were highly political or, or of the worst type. And there's Paul in the midst of them. Imagine, if you would, with these criminals, what type of soldiers you would need for these type of criminals. You probably wouldn't have the novices there, would you? For these type of men? You probably would have some soldiers who had seen a few battles, who had had been used to wielding a sword a little bit, who had, had maybe experienced some things in life, and now we have some of the background 
for Paul with these men and the Bible tells us in a Julius, a centurion of Augustus' band. Centurion, remember him when we come down to the story a little bit. Verse number two, entering, entering into a ship of Adramidium, we launched, meaning to sail by the coast of Asia, one Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, being with us. And the next day we touched at Sidon, and Julius, that's a centurion, courteously entreated Paul and gave him liberty to go into his friends to refresh himself. So in a whole boat full of hardened criminals and these hardened soldiers, the centurion is already taking a liking to Paul. You notice that? And gave Paul liberty to go refresh himself with his friends. And it's interesting that the Bible, one, would include that, and, and two, that God would allow him that. You know that as we go off through this, we're going to find out he's in a big storm, and he's going to, to, to go to Rome to stand before Caesar. But you notice how God is still taking care of him? He allowed Paul to be refreshed. You ever feel sometimes like you're all alone? And God not only is not refreshing you, does not allow you to be refreshed? I read this quote that said, Life, when I said, could it get any worse? I meant it as rhetorical question, or a rhetorical question, not a challenge. You ever feel that way? I think we all have before. Someone else said this. They said, uh, I didn't know that rock bottom had a basement. <laughs> Days we feel that way. Verse number four, and when we had launched from thence, we sailed under Cyprus because the winds were contrary. Already there was some opposition in the winds and in the, in the sailing. And verse number five, when we had sailed over the sea of Sicilia and Pamphylia, we came to Myra, a city of Elyka. And there the centurion found the ship of Alexandria sailing into Italy, and he put us therein. And when we had sailed slowly many days, and scarce were come over against Critus, the wind not suffering us, we sailed under Crete over against Salomon. You notice in these verses about three times, the Bible mentions the wind, the wind, the wind. Already, they're facing some opposition, not because of any choices of the criminals, but because of the wind. Who's in control of everything? God. He's setting Paul up here. He is setting Paul up for something here. He is, he is sending Paul to a particular place, a particular time, because already the ship can't go that fast. Don't miss this. In God's timing, and his timing is always exactly right. You ever feel that, or you ever wish that God had your watch? God, maybe you don't understand it, that I have a need and it's coming due, Lord. All right, here's my calendar, here's my Google calendar, Lord. Let me add you and share you my calendar so you know where my bills are due. God always works on his own time frame. Never wrong timing, always exact, perfect timing. Verse number eight, and hardly passing it, came into a place which is called the Fair Havens, nigh whereunto was the city of Lycia. Now when much time was spent and when sailing was now dangerous because the fast was now already passed, Paul admonished them. And says unto them, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the lading and ship, but also of our lives. Nevertheless, a centurion believed the master and the owner of the ship more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Just a, a thought as we look at some of this background here. It, it says that the centurion believed the master and owner of the ship more than Paul. I did not realize this until I studied this passage out, but according to Roman law, a centurion was, on, was in charge on the boat. In, in, the, in the Roman culture and in their, in their hierarchy, the centurion was more in charge than the captain of the ship. Now, in current culture, the captain of the ship would be able to determine whether to sail or not. In this time frame, the centurion decided if he wanted to sail, he would sail. Didn't matter what the owner or master of the ship had to say. Made no difference. The centurion was in charge on land and on sea. So when he said go, they all went. The centurion makes a choice here. He doesn't choose to believe Paul. He had already shown some, Paul some kindness before that, but now he says, you know, we got to get there. We're not going to wait. In verse 12, and because the haven was not commodious to winter in, the more part advised to depart thence also, if by any means they might attain to Fenice and there to winter, which is a haven of Crete and lieth toward the southwest and northwest. 
Verse number 13, we're going to begin a storm. We know some things about the storm. I call it this this morning. It's a petrifying disturbance. Giving you some background. In fact, over the next few verses, it is said that we find no other account anywhere in writing of this time frame, how a ship manages in a storm, than this passage right here. I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm talking about in classical literature. The scholars say how a ship handles a storm is found nowhere else in detail as it is found right here in the Bible. Luke is the writer of Acts, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, brought to us such tremendous detail. You know that God cares about the small details? And in no other classical writing... We're talking saved or unsaved. Is there as much detail about a ship and a storm in this time frame than these next verses right here? There's about to be a petrifying disturbance. They've embarked on this ship. Paul's a prisoner with these other hardened prisoners. It's with a centurion now which has decided to reject his advice. And why would he listen to Paul? Paul's not a sailor. Paul's not a master of a ship. Paul has taken some journeys on ships before. He's done some missionary journeys. But Paul is a follower of the Lord. Paul has wisdom that comes from above. We're going to find out throughout this time that Paul was exactly right. Because he was following the Lord. God who's the master of the sea. Verse number 13, we have a petrifying disturbance. Verse 13, and when the storm and when the south wind blew softly, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence they sailed close by Crete. But not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called the Clyden. When the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind, we let her drive. And running under a certain island, which is called Claudia, we had much work to come by the boat. Which, when we had taken up, they used helps undergirding the ship, and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksands, strake sail, and so were driven. And we, being exceedingly tossed with a tempest, the next day they lightened the ship. And the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared... And no small tempest lay on us. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. I want to talk for a few, for a few minutes on this petrifying disturbance. The question I'll pose this morning is, what is your response when the storm outside is horrible? I noticed in this thing a few points about this petrifying disturbance. First of all, that Paul was a captive he was headed to Caesar, he had, appeared, he had appealed to him, and he was not getting out of the current scenario. There was not an escape plan for Paul. If he had tried to escape and jumped overboard, they would have killed him. Because under Roman law, any prisoner that escaped was given a life of the soldier, was given for the life of the prisoner. So there was no getting out of this scenario as a captive. I find a striking resemblance, a striking correlation to my life and your life. There are times that we're caught in a boat and we feel and we are held captive. And we've got nowhere to go that we can't get out of it, nothing we can do. He was held captive, but then I noticed that the boat was also caught in this. The Bible says that in verse 15, and when the ship was caught... This is unbelievable, I think. In verse number 14, the Bible says there was a tempestuous wind called the Eurocliden. Eurocliden, known as a northeast wind, still a storm that they know in the Mediterranean Sea over there. It was a terrible wind, but, but there's a little phrase in there. If you look there in verse number 14 where it says, a tempestuous wind. You see that? Tempestuous wind? You could almost miss it if you, if you were to just read it kind of quickly. A tempestuous wind. But if you were to look up that word, you would find in the Greek that it is typhonicus. It sounds like our word, help me, typhoon. But in fact, this is known that this word, typhonicus, which we get our current word typhoon, in the Greek language was the strongest storm depiction. 
There was nothing stronger, no word at all in the Greek language that could describe a wind stronger than this word right there, the word that we get, tempestuous wind. You see, what Luke is telling us in incredible and careful detail is that in this ship and in this storm, this was not just any storm. This was not just a mild, oh no, what will we do? But he's saying that this storm was the worst storm known to mankind at that point. The tempestuous wind. Luke, because of his detail, was not over-exaggerating. He was not giving us a fish story. We got fishermen here at church, don't we? How big was that fish? Oh, you won't believe it. I got a deer the other day. I didn't, but you hear these deer stories. How big was it? Oh, man. You know, 30, 40 point. Tracted for six years in my bare feet. Now, there was a man who used to go to church here. It's related to the Martins. He tells a story, and I love the story, about the time that he, he killed a deer with a knife. He had been out hunting, and they had shot a deer, I believe, the night before. It had taken off running. The next morning, they're, they're uh, out tracking this deer, and he found it, and he grabbed one of the antlers. He said as he grabbed it, the deer stood up on its hind legs. He went on to say that he had been carrying a hunting knife all day long. He had a sheath for it and was kind of bothered by this hunting knife, but it was in his hand all day as he walked, and as this deer that stood up on its hind legs, as he had one hand on the antler, he just slid throat right there. I said, now that's a deer story. You can't top that. You, you grab the deer and killed it with a knife? Come on now. That's a good deer story. But Luke is not telling us a deer story right here. He's not telling us a fish story. He's not exaggerating. He said that this wind, this tempestuous wind, was not just a bad situation, not just a hard time. The ship was going to rock around a little bit, a little bit of motion sickness or maybe a little bit of wind. It was the worst storm known. There are times in our life when we're in something that's the worst thing known. It's bad. Not just a stub the toe bad, though that can hurt, right? Not just a splinter, that can be painful, but a terrible, terrible situation. You see, the background of this statement is not found where Paul is just lavished with riches and good food and comfort. But the background of the statement is where Paul is in the worst possible situation. Yet he still makes a choice. Beyond that, I see two more points in this. In verse number 15, where they say this, the end of verse number 15, we let her drive. The wind got so bad that they said to the boat, you go wherever you want to go. They stopped trying to control the direction of the boat. They stopped trying to set the direction of the ship. They stopped trying to go where they wanted to go. Hands off. They were now controlled by the situation. Where were they going? Wherever the wind took them. I don't know about you, but I don't really like to be out of control in a vehicle. A few years back, I was driving down I-75. It was a kind of a wintry night. I was staying with traffic going about 65 miles an hour. If you know me, it's slow for I-75. All of a sudden, the back end of my vehicle started going sideways instantly. Like just, I'm going sideways down the road. Truck in front of me, he went sideways off the road. What do you do at that moment? You pray. Lord, help me get it direction again, straight, let off the gas, begin to slow down. All of a sudden, the truck again went whoosh, sideways again. Like, oh boy. Another vehicle hit the concrete right here. Out of control. It's not a good feeling. You don't say, boy, you know what? Let's do that again. That was fun. You say, you know what? It's time to get where I'm going and stop. How would you want to be in the middle of an ocean on a boat with 276 other passengers, or 275 other passengers, in a storm that's the worst storm known to man, and now you can't even drive the boat? It's controlled. See, it was not Paul's fault. 
He didn't start the storm. Compared to Jonah, Jonah's storm was his fault, wasn't it? But this wasn't Paul's storm. This was God's storm. And last I see this, verse number 20. And when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us. I like that, and no small tempest lay on us. The understatement of the year, no small storm. This was a storm of the century. All hope that we should be saved was then taken away. It was crushing. 